there. Um, so this is very, very similar to what we did in the lecture videos, uh, and uh, we did similar things on the uh, on the first exam, where I give you a chemical symbol. It would have the mass number and the atomic number. So, for example, like carbon 14, and it might not have that 12 there. Um, the 12 is, uh, or sorry, that wouldn't be 12. That would be 6. And I put 12. And it's not going to let me just delete one part of it. So it would be that. Um, usually you wouldn't see the atomic number down here. Um, so the 14, that is the mass number. If you remember, that is the protons and the neutrons added together. It's the mass number. And the atomic number, which is the one down below, that is the number of protons. And so I would expect you to be able to look at a symbol like this and tell me how many protons does it have, how many neutrons does it have, and how many electrons does it have. So in this particular example here, because the atomic number is six, that means we have six protons. Because the mass number is 14, that means we have eight neutrons. Because this is the protons and neutrons added together, so if we subtract out the protons, what we're left with is neutrons. And because there is no charge given, that does not mean that we have zero electrons. That is probably the most common mistake I see on the electrons. Just because no charge is given doesn't mean that there's zero electrons. That means that we have the same number of electrons as protons. They balance each other out. And so there's no overall charge. So we, in this case, we'd have 8, 6, and 6 are three values there. And so I would expect you to be able to do that, you know, just with different uh, symbols. Okay, uh, any questions about those first two? By the way, uh, if you hear strange noises coming from uh, what sounds like outside my room, uh, I have my, uh, my boys with me today, and my nanny flaked on me again. Uh, thankfully, this is the last chance that she has to, to do that. Um, since the class is ending, <laughs> um, I, I won't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> It just it's it's kind of sad that the the very last day. Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, hopefully, I won't need any more from this point forward because the boys should be going into school in the fall. So, yeah, it's just it's kind of sad that the very last day she was going to be watching them, she doesn't show up. But, oh well. Oh well. They behaved fairly well today. So hopefully they won't get too rowdy. But if I have to stop and go deal with them, I apologize. Okay. So let's continue on here. The next one here is pretty self-explanatory. Nomenclature. Know, not, know how to name stuff. So uh, I expect you to be able to name any type of molecule that we named earlier in the class. So that was like the... Uh, Ionic compounds, uh, molecular compounds, uh, polyatomic ions in compounds, uh, as well as uh, acid-base molecules. So all that stuff that we need were uh, practicing naming before, and we had questions over before, uh, same deal here. Know how to name that stuff. And I would just caution you, don't cheat, and Google the molecule to find the name. Uh, you will very often 
get the wrong name because what Google will usually give you is the common name or the most common name because uh, molecules very often have multiple names just depending on the the system or what what it's commonly known as what people usually call it um, molecules will have multiple names and Google will tell you the most common one I don't necessarily want the most common one though I want the one that follows the rules that we discussed so do not trust Google it will lead you astray don't cheat is what I'm saying because that is cheating if you just look it up do not commit academic uh, dishonesty uh, work out the name using the rules that we discussed and give that to me because uh, if even if you get a wrong answer if I can tell that you got the wrong answer working at it using the rules you will get some amount of partial credit if I can tell that you got the wrong answer by googling it which I can pretty much always tell you will get zero so don't google it it's not a good idea uh, the next one there mass moles molecules conversions so being able to convert the mass of something to the moles of something and vice versa and remember we do this with the molar mass or the molecular weight or the formula weight or whatever you want to call it the number from the periodic table that's what that is and convert from moles to molecules so remember we do this using uh, using Avogadro's number so the uh, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd so be very comfortable converting between mass and moles and moles and molecules and you know doing both as well so going all the way from molecules to mass and all the way from mass to molecules because you will be doing that on the exam this is another one of the really important things that you really need to know how to do uh, to pass this class and so there will be again multiple questions over this on the final uh, not like six or seven but uh, it's probably probably something like three I forget exactly how many but something like that there will be a decent number of points that are just over doing these uh, conversions okay stoichiometry is the next one there uh, and for stoichiometry it'll be relatively simple examples that I will expect you to do uh, and you will actually let me let me go and check real quick I want to make sure the method that I used for the final here so for stoichiometry here's what I'm going to ask you to do so pay attention because I'm essentially telling you the problem right now I'm going to give you a reaction something like we have A plus B reacts to make C and D Again, just say some generic reaction obviously it'll be a real reaction in the problem but just for the sake of example here so we have A and B react to form C and D and I'll tell you you have I don't know a hundred grams of A and B so you have a hundred grams of both so not a hundred grams combined just you have a hundred grams of A you have a hundred grams of B and then I'll ask you what is the theoretical yield of C and that'll be the question I'll give you a reaction give you an amount of starting material and I'll ask you how much of one of the products is made that is going to be your uh, your goal essentially what you're trying to find is how much of a certain product is made what is the or what is the maximum amount that could be made given that amount of starting material 
There was other stuff in stoichiometry that we look, looked at in the class itself. So um, we looked at like uh, percent yields um, and not just theoretical yields. Uh, but for this exam, keeping it fairly simple, uh, and it is just going to be something like this, where you're just going to find a, uh, a, the a theoretical yield, given some information. Okay. Uh, oh, and I forgot to share. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to share my screen. I always forget to reshare my screen. So this is what I drew just a second ago that uh, you were supposed to be able to see. There it is. So uh, A plus B goes to C plus D. So here's our reactants. Here's our uh, products there. Did I start? Yeah, I did start that. Okay. Our reactants, our products. We have 100 grams of both of those. What's the theoretical yield of this product? Okay, so are there any questions about that or about any of the last three that I went over there? Nomenclature, mass moles, molecules, stoichiometry. Okay, let's continue on then. So the next one here on the list is electron configurations. Pretty straightforward. Know how to write them. Just like we did for uh, the previous exam, know how to write the electron configurations. Uh, the questions will be asked in the same way that they were uh, in the previous exam, so that hopefully you're kind of used to that format of how you would input those. Um, just know how to write the configurations. And uh, once again, don't trust Google. Do not Google the answer. There are many elements that have electron configurations that don't follow the rules. They are in the minority. That's why we still consider them to be rules, the things that we follow. But there are quite a few. And I am definitely not above putting one or more of those into the exam just to make sure that you're not just googling the answers and co copying them down. You need to follow the rules. So I could give you some kind of a transition medal maybe um, and ask for the uh, for the electron configuration and if you google it Google will give you the true electron configuration but I'm not looking for the true configuration. I'm looking for the configuration that follows the rules that we learned in the class. So again, don't Google the answer. You will most likely get the wrong answer, which technically is correct, but it's wrong for our purposes. <laughs> um, so if you do that, again, you will get a zero on that question. And if you're Googling stuff all over the place in the exam, you might end up with just a zero on the whole thing. So again, don't Google stuff. Use learn the material like we have it in the class uh, and answer the questions to the best of your ability. That's, the, that's what you want to do. Uh, similar thing here with Lewis structures. Uh, you should know how to write Lewis structures for simple molecules like we did in the class. Uh, I'll ask you questions again just like in the previous uh, exam. It would be the same style, the same uh, formatting and everything for those questions. Um, so you'll just be you'll be telling me how many how many lone pairs, how many bonding pairs, you know, all that all that same kind of stuff that we did for the uh, the previous uh, exam with Lewis structures. I wish there was a way that I could see you see your drawn out Lewis structures, but there's just not a way to do that for the exam, at least. Uh, from the Lewis structure labs that I've looked at, it seemed like most of you are doing pretty well on those, so hopefully it won't be a, a problem. Uh, the next one there, polar versus nonpolar bonds and molecules. So I do expect you to be able to determine if a molecule has polar bonds and if the molecule itself is polar. Because remember, those do not necessarily go hand in hand. Uh, you can have a molecule that has polar bonds, but the molecule itself is not polar. Um, so I do expect you to be able to work that out. Uh, and obviously, 
um, you feel free to have your electronegativity table just sitting there next to you while you're taking the exam. Um, if you have a printed out version, that would probably be a lot easier than just trying to find it uh, in the PowerPoint or anything like that. Uh, and then that flowchart as well. Obviously, you can have the flowchart printed out, and I would encourage you to have the flowchart printed out and available for you to look at. Once again, just because it's a lot faster than trying to find it on the PowerPoint slides as your as your time is ticking on the exam. Uh, next one here, the ideal gas law. Essentially, be able to solve for any part of that. So we have PV equals NRT. Pressure times volume is equal to the number of moles times the gas constant times the temperature. So be able to solve for any one of these uh, really just four things because this is a constant so we already we always know what that is uh, but any of these four other things you should be able to solve for those so I could give you a question and say you have a sample of gas it has this pressure and this volume uh, and it's at this temperature how many moles of gas must be in the sample and so you would have to do a little bit of algebra to get in by itself so you just divide both sides by RT in that case, so that these would cancel and you just have n by itself over here. And so then you take the numbers that I gave you, plug them in, and solve it. I might make you convert one of the units. I wouldn't be super, um, super cruel and petty and like give you all wrong units. Um, I wouldn't like, yeah, because if, if you remember the units you're supposed to have, you're supposed to have atmospheres. Kelvin and liters, uh, as well as moles, like those are supposed to be your four units that you use for gases because that's what's in R. If you remember, R is at 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole K. So the units that we use on the rest of the stuff has to match those units, liters, atmospheres, moles, Kelvin. Uh, so I might make you convert one of those. I don't even remember any of them where I'd ha even have you make two. But I for sure would not be cruel and like give you, you know, your pressure in millimeters of mercury, your volume in gallons, your temperature in Fahrenheit. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't like do all of that. <laughs> that would just be. At that point, the question is more of a unit conversion question than an ideal gas law question. Um, so I might do something like maybe give you the, the volume in milliliters instead of liters, but everything else is the correct unit. Um, so if you forget to convert to liters, like it would be pretty obvious to me in your answer that that's what you forgot to do, because it's just a, it's a three orders of magnitude difference there, um, going from milliliters to liters. And so it's really easy for me to pick up on that mistake. Uh, and so you would get partial credit on that because I can see, oh, they did everything right. They just forgot this one thing. Um, but hopefully you won't forget uh, to check for that stuff. Okay. So the, uh, the next one here is nuclear equations. Uh, essentially, again, just the exact same stuff that I told you for exam three. You should be able to write and analyze uh, nuclear equations for like uh, alpha decay, beta decay, and uh, positron emission are, th are the three big ones. Um, there's another one that I don't think we actually mentioned. It's uh, electron capture, but uh, we don't talk about that one in this class, I believe. We talk about that one in my Chem 2 class. Uh, but you should be able to write nuclear equations for those. Um, one thing that I'll do sometimes is uh, and I think this is actually the way I do most of those questions, is like, I don't have you write out the whole thing. Um, instead, I would give you maybe the thing that you're starting with, like maybe you have radium, uh, I don't remember what, I'd like 181, I don't remember what the mass number would be, but I would give you some, some starting isotope, and then I would tell you that it's undergoing alpha decay, and so then I would ask you to fill in what would it's this other thing, the other thing that's made, 
what is its mass number, what is its atomic number, and what is its elemental symbol. Um, so it's more like a fill in the blank. You're not necessarily writing the whole thing, but it's, it's fairly close. Okay, uh, any questions about those before we jump into the uh, biochem and organic stuff, which uh, should go pretty quickly. Okay, let's talk about these last topics. It looks like it's taking up half of the exam, but it's actually not. <coughs> it was just a lot harder for me to, like I can't just say organic chemistry and just put that on there. <laughs> I was trying to be a little more specific than just saying no organic chemistry stuff, no biochemistry stuff. Um, so I try to be a little bit more specific here. <coughs> So each of these is, is more specific than the ones like, you know, just Lewis structures. Like, that's fairly broad, but, um, you know, we, we were fairly limited in our look at Lewis structures. Uh, so most of these are pretty uh, self-explanatory. So the first one here, be able to identify alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. So if you remember, the differences there are alkanes only have single bonds, alkenes, Keens can have as many single bonds as they want, but if there is one double bond, that is considered an alkene. Same thing with alkynes. So alkynes, you can have as many single and even double bonds as you want, but if there is a single triple bond, then that is considered an alkyne. So you should be able to identify uh, those three. So if I were to give you a molecule and have you categorize it, you should be able to tell me which one of those three it would fall into. Same type of thing here with the functional groups. So all those functional groups that we talked about in the lecture videos, you should be able to identify those. That should be pretty easy. This was a lot more difficult for my students that had to take it in class without notes. <laughs> Since you're taking it at home, um, and you're going to have your notes available, it should be uh, Maybe I shouldn't say easy, but at least much easier than taking it in 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 a classroom without notes. Um, so you should be able to identify those functional groups. Um, kind of similarly here, be able to identify carbohydrates. So if I were to give you maybe one or two or three different molecules and say which one of these is a carbohydrate, you should be able to tell me. Again, be looking for uh, lots of, of uh, oxygen uh, in the in the molecule, that's the main thing there. Uh, lots of OH groups. Those are going to be our carbohydrates. Um, next one here: be able to identify saturated versus unsaturated lipids. Why do I say lips? <laughs> that should be lipids. I'm going to blame that on a uh, an autocorrect. Unsaturated lips. <laughs> That cracks me up more than it should. Um, fatty acids and triglycerides. So if you remember saturated versus unsaturated, the uh, different molecules that are saturated have as many hydrogens as possible, which means no double bonds and no triple bonds. It is all single bonds. So it is saturated with hydrogens. If there is even a single double bond, that is unsaturated. And I know it it's kind of seems counterintuitive. I was like, oh, but there's just one, and it's such a big molecule. And, but it actually does have a really big effect on the chemistry if you have even just one double bond somewhere in the structure because those molecules are really heavily dependent on all those chains being able to stack up against each other really nicely. And if there's a kink in one of those chains where it doesn't stack really nicely, it just messes up the whole thing. Um, so even just one double bond like that can have a really big effect on the chemistry. Sorry, I'm getting into lecture mode again. Uh, back to the list here. So be able to distinguish between primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. So again, this should be a lot easier for you taking this at home. Uh, than it is for students on campus. So uh, get 
feel at least a little bit better. You know, there's there's one thing that's easier for you. <laughs> one thing easier than than uh, having normal class on campus. Uh, same kind of thing here. That's what most of these are just essentially be able to recognize. Uh, recognize phospholipids and steroids. So if you remember, the phospholipids have that phosphate group you need to be looking for. Excuse me. Uh, the phosphate group doesn't show up anywhere else. So if you see that phosphate group, uh, at least it doesn't show up anywhere else for us. It is other places, but for our purposes, that's the only place it shows up. Uh, and then the steroids have that very unique ring structure, if you remember. that. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was two six-membered rings and a five-membered ring connected together. That was a steroid. And then lastly, recognize the DNA base pairs and be able to create a matching strand of DNA to go along with the given single strand. So your good old GATC, you know, matching the, uh, the letters and all that good stuff. Again, very similar to the, uh, the previous exam. All right. How are we feeling about that? Good to hear. Is it quite as scary as you thought it was going to be when you heard it was a comprehensive final? It's, uh, I, I've left out a bunch of stuff. Like it is, it is definitely not, uh, not completely comprehensive. Um, pretty sure there's at least a couple chapters that don't even have any topics in the final. Um, and those chapters that do, it's usually just one thing. I know, yeah. Test taking... I have been genuinely and and uh, actively thinking and trying to come up with a good alternative to, to exams. Because I completely agree and understand that uh, exams are not a perfect way to to gauge student understanding the issue is that it's as far as i have i'm aware at this point there's not really a better way um at least not a not a, a practical way that's better um, there are other ways that are, are better but are just completely impractical um, for classes like this um, so i'm trying to come up with a better way um, that is still practical. I've considered, now that I have all my lectures online, um, even though I really love doing lectures, um, I love lecturing. It's my favorite thing to do. Uh, not not because I'm like, you know, the big professor up in front and, you know, oh, I'm so important, nothing like that. Uh, I just, I, I think it's fun. I like to talk about chemistry with people, as I'm sure you've noticed. Um, <laughs> and so... I've thought about now that I have all my lectures online, once we're back on campus, having some sort of a, a flipped classroom where I do some lecture, um, but mostly um, mostly working on practice problems with students and taking like a good chunk of that and like having like a mini exam every week instead of having like one really big exam every every four weeks. I'm not sh entirely sure if that would be a lot better or if it would be about the same because then again that would require students to be there like uh, I, like it's there's there's upsides and downsides to, to all the, the possibilities that's something that I've always come up against not better <laughs> yeah there's just, there's really not a, there's no, there's no perfect way to do it. There just isn't. There isn't a perfect way to do it. Uh, let's see, Shelley, do you recommend just reviewing past homeworks to practice these subjects and reviewing lectures? I would recommend looking at the topic list and number one, going back to old exams. 
and I believe you can still see your old exams, I think. Uh, you can go back to your old exams and see your questions that you answered. I don't think you can see all of the answers. I'm not entirely sure how that's set, but uh, how that works, but I believe you can at least see the questions. Um, so I would go back and look at the questions that are on the list uh, and review those. Um, also very important, I would suggest go back through the lecture videos that cover those topics and I would suggest going to the practice problems that we do in the lecture videos. Pause the video, and I encourage you to do this like in the lecture videos. I say, okay, pause the video, and I know most of you don't do it. Because <laughs> I wouldn't do it <laughs> if I was the student most of the time. Um, I would be like, oh, I'm just going to wait and see how you do it, and then I'll, you know, I'll do it later. Um, I would encourage you to actually pause the video before I do it before I work through the question, um, you work through it, and then see if you get the same answer as me. For a lot of the stuff here, it should have been long enough since you watched those lecture videos. You shouldn't just immediately spring to mind, oh, he did this and this and this. You should have to think about it. Um, and so that I think that's a good way of practicing those, because you're, you're essentially working through practice problems with me at that point, um, because then I will work through it on the screen so you can see how I do it. So I think that's a really good way to prepare is to go back through and so you know, like for example with the uh, um, like electron configurations um, we do some examples of those in the videos. The, the mass to mole conversions. We do examples of that in the videos. So I would say go through the videos um, that cover those topics and work on those practice problems. Uh, and the homework um, is also helpful just in, in generally practicing and preparing. It sometimes is a little bit different uh, just because the questions are asked slightly differently in Mastering Chemistry. It has its own way of, of writing out questions. Um, I think watching the videos and looking over the exams will be more helpful than the homework for that. Uh, but it's certainly the homework is not going to hurt by any means. But I would do the other two first. Yeah, yeah, and the self-assessment step at the end there is also helpful, uh, especially if you're doing the ones. Uh, I'm not sure if all of those have the answers included or if it's just every other one. Um, but at least some of them should have the answers included, so you can work through the problem and then see if you got the right answer. Th that's a uh, very helpful thing to do. Okay, uh, other questions? Anything else? Glad it's been helpful. Okay, so just uh, before I let you go, just a reminder: um, be studying. Oh, and actually, one other thing. Hold on. Um, let me make sure. Do I have that? So the uh, yeah. Well <laughs> They're, they're quiet because I put them down in front of Paw Patrol. Um, <laughs> they're watching Paw Patrol in the other room. And uh, thankfully, they're, they're not too hyper right now. Sometimes they get a little bit crazy. Uh, but I went through yesterday and was looking at the labs, um, the lab situation, because I know we missed some, uh, some labs. And the way it seems to have worked out is that I... I missed one lab in group A, I missed two with group B, but we did have a makeup for one of those. So group B uh, missed the density lab at the beginning, uh, but then we did a, a makeup for that. We had a makeup lab for that. So 
we had essentially one mist for both um, that, so we would we would have ten. Um, and actually, I think it was a little more than that, but at least it's even with with both labs missing one. And so what I have done is I have made a short, uh, but still worth a whole. Uh, a whole lab grade short assignment called move the student view here so you can see it Let's see what it look like for you the VSCPR lab so this uh, is essentially very similar to the Lewis structure worksheet it is just a worksheet um, just like the Lewis structure worksheet um, but it is for VSCPR instead of Lewis structures, although it does have Lewis structures in it. Excuse me. Um, so there are, I know it looked like there were four pages there, there's just two. <laughs> Not sure why it looked like there were four. Uh, but there are eight different molecules, and you'll just draw the Lewis structure, do your best to sketch this. I'm not going to like count off points if if it's poorly sketched, as long as I can tell that you were at least attempting to draw the correct structure. If it's clear that you were drawing the wrong structure, then you might get points taken off. But um, this is not an art class. So as long as it's clear that you're you're drawing the correct connectivity, um, I'm not going to be taking off points for sketches. Uh, but you're going to draw the Lewis structure, try to draw the 3D shape as best you can, uh, and then give the molecular shape and whether the molecule is polar or nonpolar. So this is also kind of a good practice for the for the final as well, with the polar nonpolar um, and the the Lewis structures. Most of these we've actually done at one point or another in the videos. Um, so uh, you might you probably go back and find some of those. But this will count uh, for making up for the one of those missed labs that we had there. So uh, make sure that you get that done. It is available, I believe, until the 14th. Yeah, so over a week. So we have over a week to get that done. Uh, but like I said, it's, it's a good thing to get done to help uh, study for the final. So I would get it done fairly soon. And it is available now. I thought I'd made it available last night, but apparently I didn't. But it is available now. Um, so it'll be available for uh, the next week and a half or so. Okay, so with that uh, being said, um, so we will uh, have studying for the final this week and uh, getting that makeup lab done uh, so that we have 10 labs that we had for the, for the semester, which is one fewer than I was hoping to have, but all things considered, having 10 when we were supposed to have 11, I think, is, is a, an unmitigated win, <laughs> having 10. Um, so we'll have those 10 labs. Uh, and we will meet back here next Tuesday to uh, talk about the finals some more and answer any questions you might have. All right. Have a great rest of your day.